Welcome to another episode of Wealth Uncensored. I'm sitting here with my good friend, attorney Mike Abel, who's sitting in Arizona at the moment. And today we're going to be talking about U.S. estate planning for foreign investors, whether they own U.S. real estate or other assets in the U.S., what happens with those assets when they die. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton, Let's dive into today's show. Nice to see you again, Mike. Hey, good to see you, Jimmy. Glad to be here. You know, it's an interesting topic I want to discuss today because ran into it many times over here with our foreign clients. So it's really important they understand what needs to be done. All right. So let's start off with what I think happens to a lot of foreigners, right? Is they come by a vacation home or they make an investment in the U.S. or, or, or whatever, and they never really think of what happens if I die owning this. You know, I mean, I know there's different things available in the U.S., like trusts and wills and all this stuff, and we'll get into that. But I think most foreign investors that invest in the U.S., you know, they just don't do anything, right? They come by the assets, whether like mm-hmm. a real estate or whatever, and uh, and then the unexpected happens. They die owning it. So what happens if they die not having a U.S. will or trust? Well, I ran into that numerous times. I have had one just last year with somebody owning a bunch of real estate. And if they don't have anything to address the asset upon their demise, but bluntly, it's it's a nightmare for them over here. Because over here, we have intestate succession statutes, but it gets extremely complicated for a foreigner. Just for those listeners yeah. that might not know, what is an intestate statute? All right. Intestate statute, it deals with people dying without a will. The government gets to determine who gets your assets. For most states that I've done any work in, most of it is, okay, if you're you're married, well, your wife's going to get it. However, in half the states, it also depends on if you have kids, because you might want your spouse to get it, should say. Uh, but they'll say your spouse gets part of it, but yet kids get part of it. But then if you had a prior marriage, that prior marriage children might have part of it. So it could go to totally people that you do not want it to go to. And it's a government's plan that says it goes to these people. If they're not there, it goes to children. If they're not there, it goes to maybe parents. It might go to your brothers and sisters, your uncles. It's a statute that describes the distribution of property when people die without a will. That's what an intestate succession statute. In my view, most of the times I'm looking at it, it's not who you want your assets to go to. You may have a certain way you want them to go. And if you don't specify that, then your wishes are not followed. And if you have young kids... And as soon as they turn 18, if you had a bunch of property over here, you know, could you imagine being 18 and inheriting a couple million dollars? What would you have done back then? It would have probably been a nightmare. Party time. <laughs> yeah. So not a good thing to do with kids. So, you know, and, and you run into so many other things because, you know, we're not going to really touch on it today, but with the tax that's involved in the processes and withholding and stuff, Foreigners need to be very careful how they own any asset in America to avoid probate, tying it up, who it goes to, and tax. Let's say, for example, a foreigner dies. They don't have any sort of will or trust in in the U.S. So now the the assets are going to pass according to the interstate laws of the state where the assets are located. So. And then that's just going to determine who gets what. Nobody has anything to say about it because that's the law. Now, in that case, let's say, for example, there's assets in multiple states. Does that mean that if those states where the assets are located have different intestacy laws, that the assets in the different states may go to different people altogether? Yes, it really can because 
they're going to look at where you have closer connections. You can argue sometimes if you have them in bulk of everything uh, in one state, for example, you're going to have to file an ancillary probate in the other state. And then you're going to have a fight over choice of laws. You might want to have, say, Arizona, where I am, Arizona law apply in California. Good luck. That's never going to happen because California is going to deny it. However, if you maybe did that and went to Florida, Florida might say, okay, Arizona can apply here. We don't care. But that's a lot of expense and a lot of fighting with foreigners that have multiple jurisdiction of assets in multiple states. You're talking years to get this thing sorted out. And so what happens from from a practical standpoint? Because obviously the assets are in the name of the decedent. The assets need to be split up and distributed according to the intestacy laws to the to the heirs. What 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 does that process approximately look like? I mean, what do you do? You 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 go to the you have to go to the court, I assume, right, and, and open some sort of a probate proceeding. Yeah, you're going to go to the court and open up a probate proceedings. Then you have to start looking for everybody that that person could have had any debt to, any credit. And we're going to be sending out notice to creditors. We're going to be sending out notice to any heirs, which means you're going to have to hire somebody to determine who are the heirs of this individual. And then they're going to go ahead and go through a long, drawn-out proceeding to determine or to verify the first thing that has to get paid, they said, is creditors. So we have to make sure all they get paid. And then we have to look at who has rightful possession of the property or rightful ownership interest within the property. And then that causes fights. And then if you have multiple jurisdictions, we start that fight. And the one thing to keep in mind is several states in the U.S. charge tax on the distribution of estate assets. They have a state taxation on a state level. That's why we get fights over here. Because if we let one jurisdiction control over another, they won't get their tax. So you're going to be litigating this out for a long time. The attorneys are going to love you. Because the attorney is going to make a lot of money for doing nothing because you did not plan. So, I mean, it's a long, drawn-out process with a lot of court filings, a lot of people trying to interject, and even state actors and local actors trying to interject to get their piece of the pie. That's something that a lot of people don't realize in the U.S., right? Is I mean, you don't just have a federal estate tax but several states have their own estate tax, the distribution of assets, fees, the lawyer fees and everything. And the other thing I don't think people realize is how long this can take, right? I mean, it can take years. I've seen cases take three, four years plus. Wow. So, I mean, it can really go out, especially if you have second, third marriages or anything like that. You forget about time frames. It's done. You're going to have arguments everywhere. That's sort of... Let's say the worst case scenario, right? There's no will, person dies. But what happens if, because I think a lot of people, which I've never understood how people can think this, but but people do, right? Like they do their estate plan in their home country, and then they think yeah. that this applies all over the world, right? So what happens if, if the person does have a will, but it's just not a will from the U.S.? It's a will from, from their home country. Will the, the state's in the U.S. recognize the, this foreign will so that at least the assets are distributed in, in, in accordance with, with their wishes so it goes to the people that they wanted to get it? Well, that depends. That would take a study on all 50 states because all 50 states are different when it comes to that. Some states allow you to, to domesticate the will, but then there is a lot of issues that come up before they'll even accept it such as certification back at your home country, getting certified copies, getting them um, maybe sealed, all sorts of things that we don't have over here. Then we have to determine, are they going to accept it? Was it properly signed? Was it properly notarized? Well, there was no notary because we don't honor notaries in most places that don't have the Hague Convention. So it becomes a litigation nightmare all over again is I've had some attorneys uh, in some states that have told me, hey, don't even say we have a will. It'll be easier to go and test state, even though it might take a couple years. The cost of getting a foreign will domesticated in their state is so hard, so expensive, they don't want to even acknowledge it. 
So it's a crapshoot. It's not something you ever want to rely on for any of these people. Okay, so long story short is, if you're going to own assets in the U.S., you need to do some estate planning in the U.S., right? Yes, you have to do something in the U.S. Otherwise, your heirs are going to have a nightmare situation, and they're probably going to be spitting on your grave because they're not going to be happy with what you left them. I think a lot lot of people think like, okay, that's a simple solution, right? We'll just do a will in the U.S. As, As I understand it, I mean, it's thinking back a long time ago to law school, but... If you have a will in any U.S. state, then it needs to be recognized by every other U.S. state. Correct. Okay. Yep, we have full faith and credit. So, so, so in this case, if they had a will in the U.S., then the assets that they have in the U.S. would get distributed in accordance with that will. Correct. And that's what we do a will for. It's going to say, these are the people I want to actually receive the benefit of my assets. Who are we going to go ahead and give them to? But recognize that's also a long, drawn-out process because anything in America, when it deals with courts, we have time frames, drawn-out things, notification requirements. So they're going to have a lot of things that they are a lot of hoops they have to jump through. But at least their assets are going to get to who they want them to. And you can always say that if you do a will, decent rule of thumb is to estimate 10% for a foreigner is going to be in fees, cost, attorney, you know, for attorneys. So if you have 500,000 here, you're going to have about 50,000 in expense just to get the assets to your heirs without any tax considerations either. So don't even look at tax on that. That's just going to be cost associated with the transfers. How long does the probate process actually getting, you know, the assets distributed to the heirs generally take? Um, For foreigners, generally, I tell them not to even expect anything for nine months to a year um, at the earliest. So, and it could be a lot longer Depending on the circumstances, because how much property they have, what are their assets? Now, it could be quicker if they only had, you know, just say one asset worth, you know, $100,000 and there's only one heir. Okay, we might be able to close that at eight, six months. But when you start having multiple and larger assets, the time frames can go out exponentially. Not having any sort of estate planning is, is obviously the worst idea, right? And obviously, well, maybe yeah. the worst idea is just trying to rely on foreign will. I mean, you seem to be like yeah. pretty bad. Yeah. So the, the U.S. will at least will make sure that your assets um, get to go, you know, get distributed where you want them to go. It seems to me like the, the better solution, I mean, tax considerations aside, uh, because, you know, I've done a lot of content on that. People can watch some of my other YouTube videos and, and, and listen to, to some of the other podcasts. We're sticking to the estate planning now, but it seems to me like tax issues aside that the better solution would be like a living trust. Yeah. Yeah. It, for foreigners is probably the best solution. It doesn't solve our tax issues because we're going to leave those aside uh, for another day. Um, but to transfer your assets, the most the efficient way, least cost. Yes, people look at it and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to pay a lot of money, get it set up up front. Yeah, but you're going to save a ton of money if you pass away. Because when you put it into a trust, it's going to go to your heirs. It does not need a probate court. It does not need filings. It does not need to notify the world. So in essence, if you have a trust, we can transfer those assets within a couple days to your heirs. Now, it doesn't mean they don't have to still file their estate tax returns, notify the federal government. Those are all things that we take care of, but the asset can actually be transferred, liquidated, whatever the heirs need without court supervision, which is extremely important in America because you're not asking for permission then. And you're not having to give all sorts of evidence, all sorts of filings, certified copies. It's just the most streamlined way of doing it is for our you know, foreigners to have a trust associated with their ownership. Whether you have no will anywhere in the world or a foreign will or a U.S. will, the essential sort of, say, the way everything works, right, is the assets are titled in your name. 
you die, then there needs to be a probate process, either based on the intestacy laws, the foreign will, or the U.S. will. And then, you know, through this probate process, which is going to take a long time and cost a lot of money, then the assets get transferred to the heirs, right? Yep. Whereas with with a trust, the assets would not be titled in in, in your name, right? They'd be titled in the name of, of the trust. So... And, and the trustee would then be in control of that trust and could make the distributions to the beneficiaries in accordance with the trust instrument, right? So, I mean, that's that's the big difference. Right. You need to ask the, the court permission because the assets don't need to be transferred to your name, to the heir's name, because the assets are already titled in the name of the trust, and then the trustee can just make make the transfers in, in accordance with the, with the trustee, right? Yep. Yep. So, and you can have all sorts of control, you know, with little kids, like I said before, you can say, okay, it doesn't go to them. You can even spin off that money to their foreign trust. I've had some where they've named their foreign trust to be the beneficiary of their U.S. trust. So it all depends on what they need done or how they want to control their money. So. You know, I think the simplest form of a trust is is obviously sort of the, the standard living trust, right? Yeah. So, yep. and, and there's no issues with a foreigner setting up a, a, a living trust in the U.S.? No, not at all. Okay. Very easy. So I think one of the big concerns that a lot of people have when, when, when you say trust, right? I mean, especially with the, the more complex trust that you and I often set up is, you know, what, what are the ongoing costs going to be? Am I going to have to pay a professional trustee? Is it going to have to file a separate tax return? All, all, all of this stuff, right? So, you know, can, can the foreigner be the trustee of their living trust in the U.S.? Yes. Yes. It's very easy. They can be the trustee. They're the initial beneficiary. They can do everything. And the great thing about a U.S. trust, unlike some foreign trust, is a U.S. trust, it, it's a grantor trust which means it's not a separate tax filing. It's nothing different. They don't need to get their own tax ID number. There's no filing of income tax because all the income goes to the person that set it up, the grantor, the initial beneficiary. The only time tax returns come into play or a separate identity is upon their demise. If they die the second one, if it's a couple spouses, um, they need to get a tax ID number and then they do report it. But until that time, we're not really filing anything for the trust. The individuals, yes. You know, we have to worry about that. So basically, if the foreigner wanted to set up a trust, they can set up this trust. They can still have Full control over the assets. They don't need to go to a third-party trustee or anything. They can sign nope. everything. They can do everything. They can also be the beneficiary. So if they sell it, they can get the money back out of it. Yep. They don't need to get a separate tax ID number. They don't need to file a separate tax return. So basically, it's like a non-existent thing. They still have full control over it as if they owned it individually. And the only time it really comes into play is when they die and the assets need to get get distributed accordance with the trust agreement, and in, in, in which case it just avoids all the probate, right? Correct, correct. You know, and, and this is something that a lot of people don't think of. You know, foreigners or any anybody, uh, you know, investors over here, we always think we're invincible, that nothing's going to happen, until I've had calls where the thirty eight year old got into a car accident. Or they died of a heart attack. Something happened. We never plan because we think that we're never going to be the person that dies. But it's going to happen to everybody. So that's why I try to tell all my foreign clients, prepare. I mean, your heirs are going to thank you if, if you do prepare it. Or they're going to curse you if you don't. So it's better off to go ahead and do it. Be prepared. Because you don't want our government telling you how your assets are going to be distributed and what needs to be paid. Yep. No, I agree. So, I mean, it sounds sounds to me like, I mean, and I totally agree with you. I mean, this is what, you know, I always tell people. I mean, this, the living trust is, is, you know, tax tax concerns, asset protection, all that stuff aside, because it's a topic for yep. another day. But from a purely estate planning standpoint, 
you know, a living trust is the way to go. Oh, yeah, definitely it's the way to go. It's so the way that most of my clients choose to go when we go ahead and we talk to them and explain to them of what can occur. You know, a little bit more cost up front, but it could save them, you know, their heirs tremendous amounts of money and grief later on. So if you're investing over here, just take a little bit of that money to make certain that your heirs are protected. And it's not that much considering your investments that you're making over here. For sure. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. It's always an interesting dis discussion. Anybody who has any questions about estate planning in the U.S., setting up a U.S. living trust, reach out to, to Mike Abel. You can reach him at uh, ablelawgroup.com and use the, the contact us form. Always, always yeah. a pleasure, Mike. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.